welcome to the MinMax Show, a place about games, friends, getting better. I'm Ben Hansen, joined by Kyle the Waver Hilliard. That's me. Welcome, sir. We're also joined by YouTube essay extraordinaire, Jacob Geller. Hello. And Jacob Geller, I need you to choose once and for all right now. What is game of the year exactly? Oh, it's before your eyes. Oh, great. Good choice. Um, and we're also joined by Emily Reese. Hello, Emily. Hello. Welcome. Uh, Emily Reese, um, every time you're on the MinMax Show... I think listeners are in for delight yeah. because you're very smart. Oh. Uh, you have a good voice and it means that oh. it's a very special episode. It's the episode all about the best game music of the year. Genuinely, yeah. Emily Reese, we get a lot of messages and every time that you're on, dogs go wild in the neighborhoods. <laughs> they don't sorry, start barking. Sorry. Everyone loses their mind. So people are very excited that you're here, Emily. So thank you for coming on the show. Oh, well, thank you for having me. It's one of my favorite things to do. So uh, each year I look forward to it. Oh, that's very sweet. Uh, you might know Emily Reese from going back to, oh, the Top Score podcast, now Level with Emily, the podcast where you interview composers. But you have a whole series that's starting to roll out now that I think we teased on the podcast a long time ago. It's all about Half-Life yeah. Alex. Yeah, we interviewed five of the people responsible for all of the audio in the Half-Life uh, VR game that came out last year, Half Life Alex, yeah. and so we interviewed the I interviewed the composer Mike Moraski like nine times, I think, and what? then I interviewed the, uh, the other people responsible for the audio as well. Yeah, and so the documentary itself is done and has been released. It just came out last week. It's two hours and twenty minutes, I think, and then um, all the source audio will be rolling out over time. Uh, but for now, the documentary is out and listenable to anyone who has an internet connection. That's awesome. <laughs> it's a, it's so cool to hear from people at Valve, period. But then people at yeah. Valve that you normally don't get to hear from, just to hear from like people on the yeah. audio team, it's amazing that, I mean, was there a Valve PR person that was like guiding you around or anything? No, no. When we went there, um, I mean, we were under NDA because this was in 2018, so... Yeah. We went in June of 2018, and I mean, no, it was just kind of wander around and meet people. And I knew Mike already, the composer, Mike Moraski, and I had met before. And I also knew Tim Larkin, who's a composer there, uh, mostly on Dota. And Tim works on, um, oh, what's the fucking Dota card game? I can't think of it right now. Artifact. Artifact? Yeah, rest yeah. in peace. Yeah, Artifact. He, he <laughs> wrote he wrote the music for Artifact too. Um, so I knew Tim, and so I you know bumped into Tim. I don't know. It's it's a very interesting place, and they're all very um, team oriented. They don't like to talk about themselves, and and that's right. a company wide thing. So to have that kind of access was really special, and was fun it yeah was amazing uh, yeah kyle you should listen to this episode it's level with emily name of the podcast by the way um all about half-life alex uh, there's a section where they talk about like designing uh the audio for jeff if you remember the <laughs> iconic jeff level oh, and yeah. they went into way too much detail talking about making jeff's mouth sounds by taking two steaks and then coating them in mayonnaise and slapping them together it's yeah. disgusting so you disgusting. Want me to the barnacles. To this? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, Kyle, you're the barnacles always... is pretty disgusting too. Talking about the, how he made the barnacles when they when they die and they barf out all their contents of their stomach. That's a funny story too. But yeah, yeah. so Roland Shaw is the one who did all the creatures and all the physics sounds, and then you know Dave Fiza did all the ambience and he did other th UI sounds as well and some other things. I mean, they all just did the coolest stuff. Yeah, it's a it's a cool experience uh lately emily reese we have been taking community questions from the back half of the show and sliding up relevant ones for a little community kickoff thing here so victor fam writes in and he has a question that only you with your uh enlightened musical brain can help us with um they say hey oh, musical taste has always felt really subjective to me even more so than other types of media what makes something the quote best music of the year <laughs> That's a really good question because it's a really impossible question yeah. to answer what the best soundtrack is, right? I mean, like, it but is totally subjective. But we're going to for sure do it on this episode of the we're podcast by running down the best sure game. We're going to do it. <laughs> yeah. 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 We'll for sure do it. And I'll tell you what my best is. But even then, one of my, one of the ones I chose is not my favorite music by any stretch. It's like not my thing at all, but it's perfect for what it is, right? 
So right. you, you do, you can, I think, step back from music and be like, well, I, this isn't my favorite, but it's really good. And I know it's good. So, um, you gotta celebrate yeah, it. I don't know. And that's yeah. the thing. It's the same as like, you know, the game of the year debates and everything, Kyle, that we're coming up on fast. That should be a fun time. It's nice to keep things in perspective where at the end of the day, which is important to repeat that cliche, we're just trying to have some good discussions about video games and highlight some good work from the game yeah. industry and let people find some good stuff. It's not right. It's not wrong. <laughs> Despite what YouTube insists, there is no correct way this list should go or not. And that applies to the music too, right? I don't know. For sure. <laughs> okay, yeah. good. It's a, it's a hard It's a hard thing, yeah. It's a hard thing. And so here's the thing. We're going to miss out on some of the best game music of the year in this discussion. There's no doubt about it, especially if you're watching on YouTube and you're saying, why didn't they talk about blank? Uh, that's absolutely going to happen. And you can help fix our mistakes. Just leave a comment with a link to one of your favorite game tracks of the year. And then we can make this uh, YouTube video the place to be for finding some good game music to listen to. So please jump down there, leave a good comment. We'd appreciate it. Okay, we each grabbed three songs from this year in game music to, to run down. Um, let's see. I, I think, Kyle, I think you got to kick it off, man. Your third favorite piece of game music from 2021. My third favorite is from a, a game I really didn't play, if I'm being fully <laughs> honest. It's from the Mega Man X mobile game, which is disappointing what? for a, a dozen different reasons. <laughs> Uh, you can't use a controller with that game for some reason. I don't know why, but that's a whole different topic. But there's this uh, really fantastic uh, sort of remix mashup of a couple different like old school Mega Man X songs that I really love. Okay, interesting. And what's the name of this uh, Mega Man X or Rockman X Dive or Mega Man X Dive? That's the mobile game. Mega Man X Dive, and then the song's called Deep Sea. Okay. All right. Let's sit back and listen to it. Let's try and give it its due here. Hey, if it's your song, you choose when to cut it off. Uh, that seems yeah, like a... it's starting to loop a little bit there. Okay, perfect. But, um, um, it is it is like a you know a remix of familiar songs, so nostalgia mm -hmm. is a big factor. But I the reason I love it so much is because it's very drum heavy. Drums are like front and center. Right. I've never heard that song like with proper drums, so I really like it. Oh, that's nice. I forgot how scary um, having Emily on the show is. Because I don't know what that means. Because you're so you're so smart, and you have the entire history of music in your head. You could go on about classical music for forty five hours or something. And meanwhile, we're like, yeah, I don't know. I liked Mega Man X when I was a kid. Here's some music. <laughs> yeah, it's you know, it's a bubble crab. It's that bubble crab music. I yeah, like yeah, 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 yeah. Drums, drums, so, good. So good just drums. know that we feel very self conscious around you, Emily. Oh God, please don't. I yeah, no, that's funny. I like it. <laughs> oh, good. All right. Uh, Jacob Geller, uh, your third favorite uh, game track, please. Uh, well, yeah, it's funny because Kyle started with a game that he really didn't play. And mine will be a game that I kind of didn't like. Uh, but 12 Minutes <laughs> has one of my favorite songs of the year. Interesting. Yes. OK. Here's... Actually, I'll say I, I think I like 12 Minutes more than most people, but more than most people still puts it at like a you know gentleman's seven <laughs> okay here we go this is uh 12 minutes a track from the soundtrack i think it's just called one it, it, yeah roman numeral one of course starts starts low starts quiet <laughs>
tells you how terrifying it is to sit in silence while everyone listens to the music you've hey, chosen. Man. We love it. We're here to just to relax and enjoy. Uh, Try radio. That is, <laughs> that is like uh, some prestige television opening credits music right, right there. Like right. I, in my head, I see like a very expensive animation with actors' names sort of being <laughs> implemented in well, the background. Well, so that's, you know? that's kind of exactly what it is because the beginning of 12 minutes where this plays is just this like very slow very deliberate clock going backwards and as it's going backwards it's just saying like willem dafoe james mcavoy right, right. daisy ridley like it really front loads the actors in there skip um, intro but <laughs> but what i like about it is i am just kind of a a sucker for an overture and i feel like what this does more than or kind of like the best you know prestige tv intros is like it has all the parts of the music that will then recur later in the game so like there's a part in that where strings come in and then there's a later song where strings are like the prominent instrument and they're kind of like pieces of piano music that then later becomes prominent and it gives you like a little taste of all of those and all of the different tones that the game is going to use um so i think it's a really cool piece i had yeah. to edit with it earlier this year i had a video that had that as a backing track and so i got really well acquainted with it and if i don't hate a song at the end of that process then it's like it's a very good song yeah passes the test <laughs> Absolutely. I love it. And yeah, it's nice to give 12 minutes some due. I know it seems like the wider internet kind of soured on that game a little bit. Uh, but it's like, hey, soundtrack's still good. And there's still That's, cool I mean, stuff in soundtracks there. Soundtracks are good. Performances are good. There we go. Y you know, lots of lots of things individually are cool about that game. Yeah. Uh, so my number three uh, is one of those that I was very much looking forward to this game. And right when I booted it up, within like 15 seconds, I was just like, yes. This is perfect. I already know this is one of my favorite pieces of the year. Uh, this is, of course, the title track to Forza Horizon 5 here. Sorry, this, this was Chrono Cross. Um, it's kind of like the pre-roll video ad before we get to the Forza Horizon 5. Yeah, oh, okay. it, like you never guess that that's like a racing a game intro, but it's just perfect for setting the mood. You're going to be in Mexico. It's just awesome. But you know, Kyle, I'm sure Riders Republic has to, has a great title track as well. Who can say which game is better? I wouldn't know. I play that game on mute. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you monster. Um, I don't know. So the composer for Forza Horizon 5 is Ian Livingstone in general. I don't know if he's the one who composed the title track here, uh, but still really love it. Then, of course, there's a bunch of good licensed songs in the, in the actual game itself as well. Um, hey, Emily Reese. Yeah. Uh, just in general, how do you feel about game music this year? Um, I feel like every year you can kind of gauge, at least from our perspective, like strong year, weak year for games overall. Do you kind of have that in your head as well for like good game music year versus weak game music year? Yes. Uh, I would say good. Okay. I would say marginally more interesting than last year, in my opinion. Um, but yeah, I think, I think it's been good. I think we're getting, you know, it's like people kind of go through phases where they'll be with a title for a while and then they'll move on. And I think we're getting to see new sides of some old favorites, which is nice in terms of like composers like Gareth Coker right. doing something not Ori, you know, it's, that's fun. I like that. Yeah. So yeah, I think it's been a good year. What do you guys think? Yeah, I don't know if it's been... I think it's really tough to compete with last year because Final Fantasy VII's soundtrack well, for the remake like knocked me on my butt. Um, but that's 
a lot of nostalgia packed in there as well. And so I think last year was just so strong. I think game wise as well as game music wise, they tend to go hand in hand, right? For strong game year, strong game music year. That this year is yeah. a little bit weaker, but north of twenty nineteen. The uh, here's the thing, Ben, and I'm yeah. not on the I'm not on the end of the year thing. So I'll take yeah. this up with you now, please. Last year was a boring year for games, and I oh! love Final Fantasy VII remake. But like, I I like virtually all of the games on my top ten more than like all the games on last year's top ten. Really? Yeah. Um, God. And, I, and I think music kind of goes hand in hand with that. Why well, I'm much more excited about game tracks from this year with obviously, yeah, we know Final Fantasy seven. Unbelievable. Um, yeah. But, you know, with with that big elephant out of the way. Right, right. I think even last so you have to go back to episode Once last you remove year. the best soundtrack of the last decade. <laughs> last That's decade. Right. Sucks. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I, I think my <laughs> my favorite game sound, songs from this year I prefer to Final Fantasy sevens, but also, you know, that's, you know, I don't have the nostalgia or whatever. Well, sure. yeah. Uh, Emily, is this a, were you leading us into your third choice for a game music oh. here? Uh, I could. Yeah. I mean, cause that's my, my example of that. Uh, good spotting there. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I did put Halo Infinite down for the third because I, it's just, it's so good in that Halo universe of music, which is like late 90s, like electric guitar, taiko drums, military. Like, yeah. And he just does it, he does it so well, and it's so much, and I, oh my God, please don't take this out of context, but it's just so much better. It's so much oh, better. Lord. And that's not Marty O'Donnell's fault. It's just like... It just sounds good, and the music back then it just didn't sound. You know what I mean? Like they had, when they remastered the it, it sounded stuff. great. But right, you know what I mean? Right. Like it just sounds really good, and um, that's that's really super fun. And all the remake stuff that he did too, like, um, and the themes, like the themes coming back and weaving. I love that when composers can take themes that we've known for two decades now and put them in really creatively and interestingly. And so there's like the female voice hovering in like with little fragments of halo themes. And it's just, it's fun. It's yeah. really, really great. Well, and it's again, sounds spectacular. Yeah. Let's go to listen here. Also, it reminds me there's a Mass Effect track that this reminds me of. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, that Sam Hewlett wrote that I love. I think it's just called Sovereign. Mm. But yeah, with all these low strings, I love that. Yeah. Bring it on. Yeah. Cool stuff. And uh, yeah, oh, Gareth Coker, yeah, if you don't know, he was the Ori composer. He did Immortals last year. And I think there's a there was a whole team of composers, I think, on Halo Infinite. Do you know more about that, Emily Reese? I don't. Okay. I really don't. I wish I did. So it's, who knows? That might not even be his track. <laughs> right. Yeah. But let's at least <laughs> tip a cap to him. Yeah. But yeah, he also did a bunch of Minecraft stuff. Um, so. Right. Yeah. But it's really right. fun to hear someone try and step into somebody else's shoes right because that's exactly what happened there so i mean 
more or less. So it's, right, it's right. cool. He just, he nailed it. I think it sounds great. And again, I can only like for so long, but I think it's really, really, really well done. Yeah. Gareth Coker was on our Crossfade podcast where it's about. Oh, fun. Yeah. That you were on as well talking about Bjork. You informed the world that it's pronounced Bjork, which blew my mind. Jerk. Jerk. Yeah, <laughs> but, says it. but on that he talked a little bit about composing halo music and he had some he's talking for a while uh, just dissecting what halo music is and he had some interesting way it's to describe timpani. it it's what it's timpani. it's timpani ah that was it no it's like it's the fact that it's it's driving <laughs> but it's not aggressive you know right. it's like aggressive music that you can do homework to which is like a weird balance you know <laughs> but yeah from what i've heard from the halo infinite soundtrack so far even just a multiplayer and stuff i think it sounds so good yeah well, i was gonna say it's interesting that like i've been playing a ton of halo but since it's all multiplayer in which like i don't know i i don't hear music in multiplayer because i feel like i'm just yeah. so tuned into like where are the footsteps where are the gunshots right, right. coming from whatever that i feel like other than the main menu I haven't got a chance to really like soak in it yet in the in the way that I want to with Halo music. Yeah, I still really like it. You know, it comes in at the end of matches and stuff like that and in between matches. I think it sounds really good. We talked about before it sounds a little explosions in the sky, but like I got no problem with that. I think it sounds great overall. Uh, <laughs> Kyle, what do you got for your next track, man? Uh, it's another game I didn't play a ton of so much as I witnessed my family playing it a lot. Uh-huh. Uh, but it's the uh, the the theme from the game Unpacking. This is the main theme. Ah, okay, here we go. <laughs> like about it a lot is that it's got like you know real acoustic guitar right but then it's just got like a little bit of sort of computerized music that's very like it kind of there's a little bit of fez disaster piece mm. in there there's like a little bit of sort of celeste soundtrack even there a little bit and right. it's all kind of like grounded by acoustic guitar so that's i i really like it for that reason. yeah yeah Flavors. That makes me think of like the Fez soundtrack is going to put me in a good mood. Right, right. <laughs> Hints of even some Portal 2 music in there, which you touched yes. on in that episode, yeah. Emily, with talking to Val. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. Which, uh, update, quick update on Portal 2. My yeah. daughter's playing it for the first time. That mm. game holds up really well and is still really fantastic. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. I, was, uh, I was just thinking about, <laughs> remember that time that Eric Wolpaw was on that podcast this year? And you just started screaming about how Valve needs to make a Portal 3. <laughs> that was such an amazing move. Just like, well, he has a platform. Now just don't stop screaming about how your company is blowing it by not doing the thing. <laughs> it's amazing. Wow. Uh, Jacob Geller. Wow us, man. Yeah, so my my next track is interesting because I sent you a very specific YouTube link because mm. I was like... the. The official soundtrack for this doesn't have the sound that I want, and that's because it is from the Artful Escape, and it includes the guitar wailing that you yes. are doing in the game. Right. Uh, so the song is called The Cosmic Extraordinary, uh, and it's as played in-game. Okay, we'll explain this after the fact. Artful Escape.
that's the sound I think of the guy falling off the platform and then respawning. <laughs> We kind of get the picture of that, but so the way the Artful Escape works is it's it's just a kind of side-scrolling platformer or whatever, but yeah. you are a guy with a guitar, and you can just, at any point in the game, hold the play guitar button, and you don't really do anything more than that, but you hold the play guitar button, and you have these kind of like you know, spacey guitar wailing solos just like come out of it. And what I think is so cool about the way that the music works in the game is that, like, it it's not like it's playing along with the background right, music. It's right. not like it's orchestrated along with it, but it just always feels appropriate. Clearly, you know, they whatever way they recorded a guy doing guitar solos and recorded the background music makes them just kind of mesh together. And it always feels like there should be these kind of like wailing chords over it. It is such a weird idea that that entire game, yeah, it's just an optional thing for the most part where you can just hold down X or whatever and then it's just this guitar solo track on top of the main soundtrack. So I'm always wondering, like, yeah, how do they do it? They just bring in a talented guitarist and it's like, here, listen to the game soundtrack and then just kind of freestyle a solo on top of it for five hours? It's insane. Yeah, because it's like you can you can stop playing and you can start playing and it doesn't feel like... It doesn't feel like a track that you're just like pushing on or off of, you know, it's like it feels kind of dynamic. And there are things where you can do you can do kind of big slides and then you'll like hold a chord for longer or whatever while you're doing it. It's just yeah, it's technically pretty extraordinary for something that in the game is literally just hold the button and you will play guitar. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a crazy one. Did you did you see Artful Escape at all, Emily, this year? I didn't. You should check it out. Neither. It's on. Game it's Pass. really. I, will. Cool. I mean, the the plot very briefly is just like there's a guy whose uncle is essentially Bob Dylan, and he wants to instead be, and everyone expects him to be Bob Dylan Jr. and instead he wants to be David Bowie. Like that's they don't use those words, right. but like yeah. that is the kind of tone of the story, and it's like three hours long, maybe. Uh, and it rules. It's, yeah. it's a really cool game. It's like Jacob nice. Dylan going through a Douglas Adams book. It's kind of like the vibe <laughs> of that game. It's so insane. Uh, okay, my choice. Uh, next one here is uh, from a game that Kyle needs to play, which is Chicory, A Colorful Tale. There's a lot of great uh, music in this one. It's from the same composer as Celeste, uh, Lena Rain here. But let's listen to Apple Foothills. So this is, you can imagine, roaming around a very Zelda-like game, kind of overworld area through the woods here. the idea there and then if you'll indulge me uh this is the boss theme for chicory as well <laughs> i was going to ask if yeah okay here it's so it's weird a good one
Very cool game, that chicory. So cool. I mean, and that one of, is, that, we reference Celeste. Celeste. Yeah. I mean, that yeah. soundtrack is by Lena Rain. Right, so it's right, yeah. like, it is, it is Celeste, uh, but it's also great. <laughs> great on its own right. Kyle, do you think you'll get time? I'm not trying to single you out, but do you think you'll have time to check out Chicory before the end of the year? I think so, yeah. Okay. I mean, I'm almost done with, we'll get into a more later Hyperlight. Uh, not Hyperlight. Solar uh, Ash. Solar Ash. I'm almost done with that. And then I think Chicory will be on deck next. Awesome. Well, I guess I got to play Halo Infinite. Get to uh, Emily Reese, uh, your next song. Yeah. My next song, Jacob might like, is from 12 Minutes. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I, it's funny because I almost chose the first track because I also feel like it's just a really wonderful, like, preview to what's to come musically, um, except for all the crazy, aleatoric, weird stuff they do later. But um, I think the. I think it's the penultimate track, isn't it? What is it called? Is it 11? Or is uh, it this 12? is 12. Oh, it's 12. It's 12. Yeah, okay. I think. So, yeah, and I love this because it's, you'll, I mean, if you remember what we just listened to a little bit ago, you might recognize the theme, but it's done with, like, bells, like glockenspiels, and, like, just, and it's interesting how aired down it is from the first version of it, which we heard earlier. So, I, I think it's great. Yeah. Here we go. So good. We don't have to listen to the whole thing, but if you don't want to, but I'm really glad that we did them in that order because I yeah. would feel weird to do the overture like after the music box yeah. version of it. <laughs> right. Yeah. I just love that. I love that version so so much, and um, the whole soundtrack is like like Jacob was saying. It's just really really well done. So, yeah. Yeah. Nice. Super fun stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Unlike parts of the game, but the soundtrack super fun stuff. <laughs> uh, all right, Kyle. Objectively, definitively, the best gaming track for this year what do you got man oh my god we're already here huh okay yeah um so my track is from the game narita boy which is a really synthy game with these really like big broad sci-fi sounds and there's like a really lot of good tracks on there that set the mood really well but um, if I'm being fully honest with myself, I had to go with the end theme, which is like such a dumb video game thing that I love where yep. it's like it has lyrics that kind of explain what happened in the game. <laughs> and it's kind of silly, but it's been stuck in my head since the moment I heard it for the first time. So that's the one I'm going with. OK, here it is. Narita boy. Crazy, they attack the digital world. They attack the digital world. Is a hero I played Digimon yeah. to protect Mother Boy, saving the world. Narita Boy, save the world. Yellow Red Blue, always be true. Then, no sword. 
incredibly literal <laughs> oh yeah there's red yellow blue levels you have the trichoma score it's, I love, it's such a like there's a good top 10 list there of like top 10 video game end themes that explain the game you just played <laughs> just in <laughs> case is, you were confused I love it plants versus zombies portal one that is uh, true. unpacking this year has one of them it's, you're right you're totally that right. was that's that's like one of those, it's just been stuck in my head. Saving the world, no read a boy. It's yeah. just like every once a week, that'll pop up in my head. I think the track might oh, be called God. Saving the Arcade World. But yeah, there's links below, by the way, for all this music. Uh, it reminds me, Kyle, I don't know if you played the Capcom arcade bundle called Capcom Arcade mm-hmm. Stadium. But their title theme also has a track with lyrics about the arcade world. Here, let's jump into this. <laughs> I love it. It's just this Perfect. old school Capcom composer. He was a composer for like Monster Hunter and Street Fighter and stuff. I was like, yeah, just write a song about how the arcade was cool, please. And you, have to write, you have to write the lyrics in five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I liked being young at the arcade. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay, sorry. Uh, Jacob, number one. Now, this is interesting oh, because, again, like Kyle, I could have picked an ending theme that explained mm. what the game was about. And instead, I did a different theme from that game, but it is objectively the best song of the year. I'm sorry uh, oh, th- for the wow. rest of you. Okay. Um, but it's written by Japanese Breakfast, the Grammy nominated and yes. top of my Spotify wrapped Japanese <laughs> Breakfast. Um, yeah. This is the song Glider from Sable. There we go. So good. Choking up. He's just literally. I started choking. choking myself in the middle of the song. <laughs> just to feel something. <laughs> <laughs> do you think Kyle, do you think Sable's gonna get its due at the end of the year? Like I saw a dear friend of the show, Sergio Vasquez, was tweeting about how he just finished it and he's like, Yeah, that is it rocked my world. You're asking me. I'm asking you, do you think it's gonna get its due by the end of the year? I haven't touched it, embarrassingly. Ooh, so, really? No, that I, is I that is really a, even a, tried Kyle, it. you know it's like it's like the best Breath of the Wild-like game since Breath of the Wild. Or Immortals. 
<laughs> yeah, about it's on Game Pass, time. right? Um, I think so. I think it might I don't know. be. Yeah, I, yeah. I you bought check it, it out but yeah, I need. I need to play it. I need to play it. I, the, the reception seemed kind of mixed, so I, I was like, oh, there's other stuff I want to check out. It's it, um, it's confusing to me. I think there are technical issues that I didn't really experience that mm-hmm. I've seen. Whenever I tweeted about it, people have said, oh, there were technical issues. Um, but it is it is a truly truly beautiful game um i was reading a little about this because like japanese breakfast is like a a big non-video game musical artist and i was kind of like oh how did she get involved with this and it was like the game director tweeted like a gif of this at her and was like hey do you want to make music for my game and she saw that and was like yes like (laughs) this is this is so beautiful i do want to do this um and and that song in particular does what I think of as kind of the Red Dead Redemption th- thing of like you're you're brought into a big new part of the world. Mm. And it's kind of this like you're just driving along and you're by yourself and that song is playing. And it's really, really cool. Nice. Um, it's I mean, she did the whole soundtrack. She didn't just do uh like the the lyrics ones but the one at the end does have lyrics and she said in an interview i think this is the best song i've ever written really Uh, and i didn't choose that one so i I guess i made the wrong choice but like (laughs) it is a it's just a great soundtrack it's so good oh that's awesome uh yeah all right my number one is a game that boy it was early on in the year and i I did not get very far because it was very hard, but I'm thinking about the best soundtracks of the year. It's the first one that I wrote down and I went back to check it out. It's like, yep, this holds up. Uh, This is Cyber Shadow. If you recall this throwback uh, Ninja Gaiden style game, uh, here's just the first uh, world's music from Cyber Shadow. You gotta have one of those every year, at least Emily Reese, the kind of the throwback NES <laughs> chiptune soundtracks. It's so good. Yeah. It sounded oh, more so Mega good. Man than Kyle's. Yeah, that is true. <laughs> yeah, it did. <laughs> yeah. The composer's name is uh, Enrique Martin for that one, but I don't think it's uh, Ricky Martin, everybody, but Enrique Martin. Uh, I couldn't find <laughs> what else he's done, but it's incredible. Wouldn't that be amazing? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Emily Reese, what do you got for your number one pick? My number one pick is from Sir Peter McConnell. Yes. Who isn't knighted, but should be. <laughs> and uh, for Psychonauts 2. And it, it's just so good. So good. So, so. Did you guys play it? Did you play Psychonauts? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely fantastic. So, I mean, it's just every area has its own feel and music, just like a lot of games with different biomes or different whatever areas. And he just... Peter McConnell is just such a master of like orchestration and like finding the right instruments to do the right things. And one yeah. of the, my favorite things about that game is that the um, main character Raz or Rass mm-hmm. is um, his instrument is the clarinet. And so there's just all this really great random clarinet through the whole soundtrack. And it was hard to choose a specific tune, but I chose this area called the questionable area because you hear Peter McConnell playing banjo, which he's really great at banjo and guitar and all that stuff. Um, 
I almost chose his electric violin track, but I, I didn't. So in this one, it's he's like playing banjo, but then he hi- found this guy. I can't remember the guy's name off the top of my head, unfortunately, but he um plays electric bassoon. Like he hooks his bassoon up to weird stuff and does weird shit, and it sounds so great. And you're just kind of like, is that a bass- is that a that's a bassoon? Is that a bassoon? <laughs> you're just like the whole time you're just like what? And it's so, so good. So, um, so yeah, this is one of the tracks, like, this is where when his family comes, they all hang out in this, right. like, campground area. And it's just super fun, campy, campgroundy kind of, like, folky music. So yeah. I'll shut up now. Yeah. <laughs> Peter McConnell. Oh. Also have like a folksy song within like hints of like the psychedelic aspect of Psychonauts. It's so wild. Oh, yeah, so with all good. the reverb and the weird effects. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. and like it starts out kind of sounding like some Hearthstone music, which Peter McConnell also did, which is also fantastic, and then just keeps growing yeah. from there. Oh. Yeah. That exact track was one that I was considering. Oh really? Oh, it's such yeah. a good, such a good soundtrack. Yeah, you know? I I was thinking about considering um the music uh. Man, no spoilers, I guess, but there's like a boat sequence. And I was like, oh, this is just Peter McConnell doing Wind Waker, which is so here. Let me put this up here. <laughs> yeah. So good. Peter McConnell, I think, is maybe the best composer I've heard when it comes to, like, having such light homages to things where it's not beating you over the head. But, like, just in that song, it's like, okay, clearly they're going for, what, that drunken sailor tune in there. But, like, just getting 45% of the way there just to, like, connect your brain to it, but then moving on. And I guess it just comes from he's done such a variety of stuff in his world, so he's got to know how to touch a little bit in everything. Yeah, well, he was heavily influenced also by, uh, like, Looney Tunes composers like Carl Stalling, who was genius at that, right? When you watch those old Looney Tunes, it's like they give you just a taste enough to know what the reference is. Right. And it's it's genius. Yeah, (laughs) that's it's so good. He's so good. (laughs) Uh, You also had a bonus track, Emily. Uh, from well, I did. I self indulgently chose one from Half Life Alex, even though it came out last year. You can this do it. Track, <laughs> okay. Yeah, I know that soundtrack really well, so I am interested to oh. hear which one. 
All right. Man, well, I mean, there were so many choices, but but yeah, go ahead and just play it. Sure. And we'll let it get to the good part. Awesome. So, yeah, a couple of things about that. So there was some pretty hectic construction around the cities this summer in a ridi- really ridiculous way. I don't know if the gas company was redoing the gas lines in the city or what, but that you'd go through either South Minneapolis, Northeast Minneapolis, and like half of the residential streets would be closed and you couldn't go anywhere. Like it was impossible to get like five blocks away. You'd have to take a 12 block detour kind of thing. And I just had a, I had a really great moment with that tune like road raging through northeast Minneapolis. <laughs> like one That's day perfect. I'm like, where the f- can I drive? Where can I go? Just like, and it's like, you know, in the background. And you're like, yes, Mike Moraski, please all day. But I also love, because in the very beginning of that track, um, he gives you a little bit of this really important sound that he spent an insane amount of time perfecting which is the sound of the energy that's being stolen from the vortigaunts and transferred to be able to and so you hear this like you know and and you you he he puts it in some of the tracks throughout the whole soundtrack but it's just really fun when you hear that because that sound for him especially was really meaningful and so anytime i hear it in the soundtrack i'm like yes (laughs) you're nailing it that's so sweet good choice uh, that was technically from last year, but you got to do it. It's in honor of the new huge episode you just dropped for Level with Emily. You got to do it. I we mean, it. which is rife with spoilers, let's be fair. <laughs> like, there, there's no, I don't even give a warning. I'm just like, yeah. Right, he's right. Gonna, he's going to spill all the beans. So, yeah. <laughs> You've had a year yeah. to buy a VR rig. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, to get a third job to buy a VR rig. <laughs> um, I have, <laughs> if you will all indulge me, I have some bonus tracks, um, if you don't mind too much. Uh, Ratchet and Clank. Can I just oh, can yeah. I just shout some out before yeah, you don't yeah. have to play Please. them? I just want to name them. Please. Um, uh, the song that plays at the end of "Before Your Eyes" is another lyric yes. song yes. called "Mesh" by Ali Lewin. Uh, that is, it's an original song. It's not about the game. It's just kind of like a really nice song. Um, also, Kyle, I'm shocked that neither of us picked the boss in Returnal that plays Don't Fear the Reaper on a pipe organ. What? <laughs> that happens in that game? I I did I did go through like the soundtrack of that and kind of listen to it and like it's one of those like love it in context. It is just creepy noises that set the mood so well. But I, I didn't really come across anything that like stood out as like I loved outside of the context. Yeah, I think of game, it might be you know? hard to, li- but there is there is a boss. There's this recurring motif of like the not the most recognizable part of "Don't Fear the Reaper," but just like a couple seconds of "Don't Fear the Reaper," and eventually you get to this boss that is like just made of like tentacles and whatever, and it's playing this giant organic pipe organ, and it's just playing like parts of don't fear the reaper <laughs> so while good. throwing a million projectiles at you it's very cool somebody needs to tell matt helgeson host of crossfade because he is obsessed with blue easter cult you can check out the episode all you need to do is play the game for 45 hours until okay. you're good enough to get to it <laughs> yeah that's great uh we had a bunch of great community suggestions too i'm sorry we won't uh, get to all of them but uh, we will have links uh in the description for all these if you want to go check them out uh jordan brown 
recommended uh, this track from Timberborn, which is a sim that I need to go back to. It's sitting in overwhelmingly positive. It looks fantastic. A uh, lumber building beaver related game. Uh, Lewis K yes. recommended uh, Delta Rune music. Nick from Atlanta recommended Persona 5 Strikers. We can't forget about Persona 5 Strikers, mm, of course. Yeah. Uh, Doreen Clyer recommended, um, well, look, we'll make an exception here. This track from Final Fantasy VII Intergrade Intermission, um, uh, a certain happy turtle track. Not the type of music you'd expect from Final Fantasy, Emily, but this is in the new Final Fantasy VII DLC here. Okay. React at the happy turtle! Yes. Get Bondro, get the happy turtle! Oh. Yeah, Uh, it's a bar called the Happy Turtle. Of course, we all knew that was coming in Final Fantasy VII. You drink there? Is that what happens there? Uh, you, it's tough you, to tell. You can. Lyrics. There's like so they have different versions okay. of like the Happy Turtle, but theme. only until your brain goes numb. That's, That's what it. I understand. Exactly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Darkfish Days <laughs> recommended a, a song from a game called Stonefly that I completely missed, um, but that link is below. Tactical Dreamer, a track from Neo: The World's End with You. Uh, Dominic Sochoki, of course, near Replicant. Uh, the remake, that soundtrack is, of course, uh, fantastic. Um, Jacob Geller, did you have more you wanted to throw out there? No, those were my big two. I okay. was really, it, it was it was hard to not pick the Before Your Eyes one, but I figured I'm going to be talking about that game so much in the rest of this month that oh. I could give it a rest for right now. I need you during those Game of the Year debates, Jacob Geller. I need <laughs> you by my side. I'm going to get annihilated out there, man. Uh, okay, here's, uh, this is from Ratchet & Clank, uh, Rift Apart. Uh, Blizzard Primed and Ready is the name of the track, uh, composed by Mark Mothersbaugh and Wataru Hokoyama. I'm just such a sucker. You throw strings on top, of, on top of any action set piece, I am immediately on board for it. Um, I actually, I realized I do have uh, another shout yeah. out. The, the game kind of got talked over because it wasn't that fun to play. But Jet the Far Shore um, yeah. had the the soundtrack by Scientific, who also did, um, you know, Sword Brothers, uh, whatever, back in the day, which was oh, kind yeah. of like a seminal indie game soundtrack. And the Jet soundtrack is also really, really good. Um, oh, nice. Also, you could have been cheeky uh, in this and just picked, um, like, How to Disappear Completely or, uh, do you know, the National Anthem or, like, any Radiohead song that's on Kid A. I tried. <laughs> I, that was my... I, I messaged Hanson and said I was just going to pick uh, Kid A as my best video game soundtrack <laughs> right. of the year. I mean, okay, so, yeah, it is this interactive experience. I guess we haven't talked about it on the podcast yet. Like, how is it, Kyle? What is it and how is it? Uh, well, it, it very broadly states right, as you walk up to it, because you're like, it's like a, it's like a, like a museum exhibit that you're walking through. There, right. it said, there's like instructions near the door, and the first thing it says is like, this is not a video game. You guys. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, okay, cool. But what it is, I mean, it's, it's basically this just like, it's not, it's really not a video game. It's just this sort of interactive environment that you walk through, and it sort of remixes Radiohead's two albums, Kid A and, um, uh, uh, amnesia, right? Yeah, yeah, right. Yep, yeah, and um, which are like 
amazing albums. Like if I were to count down my personal list of like the top five albums of my life, like Kid A would be in the top five. So, and the way they do it is they, they broke the songs apart into different ways. So you can hear like, you know, just the drum section. If you walk into this like weird obelisk in one place and like they, they have a couple tracks that play fully and they have these sort of like animations that kind of take you through. And it's just really, especially for me and maybe it sounds like maybe Jacob as well. Like, I love those albums, and so to hear them sort of in a new way right. and have all these interesting Un- visuals alongside them, is, it was really cool and really compelling, and I actually want to go do more because like, you actually have to find, it's kind of hard to find everything, so I want to go back through and try to find some of the tracks I missed and see kind of how they visualize them. Nice. That's cool, and it's yeah, just it's, PS5, uh, right? There are there are moments in it, again, I'm not on the Game of the Year debates, but like there are moments that would be like not a moment game, of the we year can't consider it um for for me of really? like kyle i think you you mentioned but there's there's that kind of void you walk into and it starts with how to disappear completely and then it plays like two others and you are just like engulfed in this thing that it's like one genuinely maybe the most impressed i have been with my ps5 tech wise like it looks huh incredible it's you know 4k hdr whatever like it is really shockingly beautiful and just the way that they visualize these songs are like it's yeah it's incredible you feel like engulfed by it i mean there's there's literally like a sequence where you're kind of borderline walking through the art of kid a which is like this very recognizable set of like mountains right it's like they realized it in a 3d and it's there's there's that part where the little the like goblins are dancing in the circle do you know what i'm talking about and then it's like i i don't i don't want to i don't want to say more about this but like who it 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 does some tricks very good and this is epic that made it right yeah so, you know, yeah, and my understanding is it Radiohead was what they were working on was it like this was going to be a physical museum exhibit. Um, oh, they had plans to make it as a physical place, um, but then COVID happened, so they sort of reevaluated. And like so, some of it, you kind of like, okay, I could see how this would have worked as a physical space, but there are other right. parts where it's like, this, this, there's no way this would have worked in a physical space, you know, yeah, which is cool, which is what's awesome about it. Yeah, maybe there's, you know, hope for harmonics being in the epic umbrella after all you know if they're just making like these yeah. weird visualizations of albums that are standalone and separate from Fortnite, maybe a little more appealing for more folks uh probably and it really folks, is but... like shockingly free like there's a, <laughs> the close like there's qr codes that you can take you to a website to buy some radiohead merch like oh, sort of littered okay. around but that's like it i don't there's okay. i don't i mean it's, i don't it understand i like yeah yeah. It'd be fun to have like the in rainbows on the PS store, like pay what you want, whatever you feel like it's worth. <laughs> yeah. Jump in hey, through PlayStation. Uh, okay, I got a couple more real quick. Um, there's a game that came out that's kind of like a bit trip runner, um, and it's called Aerial Knights Never Yield. I wasn't crazy about the game, but the soundtrack is freaking awesome. Here. Surprisingly great soundtrack for, yeah, an auto runner, but it's, it's a cool one. Um, let's see. Uh, other things to shout out. Uh, Valheim, the starting area music, like the Meadows music is one of those tracks that I've heard for 50 hours and I'm still not sick of it. I think it's incredible and so peaceful. Um, you know, Kyle, you probably don't want to give it up, but this year we did get the greatest piece of music of all time. And we should probably celebrate it in some way here. This is for Sarah. You can't ignore it. It came out this year. <laughs> I was like, what? No, I get it now. This was my number four. Good. This was my number four, huh? to be clear. We got a number one victory royale. Yeah, Fortnite, we about to get down. Get down. Ten kills on the board right now. Just wiped <laughs> out Tomato Town. My 
friend has gone down. I revived him, now we're heading southbound. Now we're in the Pleasant Park streets. Look at the map, go to the mark sheet. Take me to your Xbox to play Fortnite today. Okay. You can take me I mean, you joke, but this is my most quoted song of the year. <laughs> <laughs> every single time I am playing any multiplayer game with friends, I will say, guys, I just wiped out Tomato Town. <laughs> <laughs> it shouldn't work as well as it does. Gets in your head. Uh, it doesn't leave. Speaking of getting in your head, I need to treat this with care. This is like, I need to be in a radioactive suit. What's it called? Radon suit? Is it, what's it called? A radioactive suit? Point is! Bio, bio? Yeah, some sort of biohazard suit uh, for the main theme to Super Monkey Ball Banana Mania. If you all want me to unleash this upon the world, so help me God I will. Uh, here we go. Hello, hello, hello. From the top. Hello. everybody it's back and better than ever <laughs> it's such a stupid simple song but it annihilated my brain for a week okay is that it any other shout outs or should everybody just leave them in the comments below probably all right there's a lot uh, of death store death store just yes, has a really good course. soundtrack overall like yes. hard to pick a standout one but like soundtrack is just great you're right you're right uh, speaking of great soundtracks um we should talk about this game called Solar Ash. Uh, Kyle, you've yeah. been looking forward to this in a big bad way for a very long time because uh, it's from the creators of your beloved uh, Hyperlight Drifter. Yeah, I mean, my my most anticipated game this year. Really? Uh, for sure. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. And it's out uh, now yeah. or it's out this week? It's uh, out uh, now as of the Thursday that this podcast releases. Gotcha. Yeah, it releases December 2nd. Okay. And uh, uh, and Jacob's been playing it as well. Yeah, um, I've started it. I love it. Like I really, really love it. It's it's, <laughs> uh, you can kind of see some hyperlight drifter DNA in there. Like it's definitely. It feels like it could be in the same universe, uh, sort of artistically and right. aesthetically. Even though hyperlight is very much a pixelated game, and this is a th full three D game, but it's just like it's all about movement you like skate along clouds and then you can kind of like zip and climb the combats really fast it's not really focused on combat but it is present and like the soundtrack is disaster piece uh who did the hyperlight drifter soundtrack which is fantastic right. this one is also fantastic i would have included it probably i would have found something to put on my top three for this year but um it's not like like readily available to listen anywhere yet um i'm sure that'll change by the time the game's out but it's like this story of planets getting sucked into black holes and you're just trying to stop that from happening there's like these notes of sort of the environmental crisis we're sort of grappling with right now uh you know imagine in the sort of abstract way with black holes taking over the world and it's just kind of somber and then you can move so fast and that you is, grind on things this and is the then, big and thing. then it all culminates in these like shadow of the colossus battles and it's just I love it. Like, I, I really adore it. It's so good. It's crazy that, like, within seconds, you just start skating, and it's basically like a jet set game where you're going around this neon planet, and then you encounter the 14th Colossus from Shadow of the Colossus, and you have to battle it <laughs> as you're flying around this environment. Like, it, it, you will know within seconds if it's for you, and seeing at least the beginning of this game, it's like, okay, this is as Kyle as you can get right out of the gate here. Oh, they yeah. aren't wasting any time because it's just, hey, explore yeah, this thank world. Thank you, Heart Machine, for, you know, making a game for me. I appreciate yeah. it. You know, feel free to include other people in the future, but, you know, this one, thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. Jacob, what do you think of this thing so far? Yeah, I 
really like it. I, I don't think I'm as hot on it as Kyle. And like part of the thing that I've I've been trying to get over is like some of the things that I don't like as much are just expectations that I had from the, from the makers of Hyper Light Drifter, right. you know, like was kind of in my head. So like an interesting thing about this game as compared to that game is there is a lot of dialogue and it's all spoken, you know, mm. that it's that like characters are saying the things and and it's quite I mean, it's like it's abstract in that it's about a planet being sucked into a black hole, but it's very literal with it's very on the nose with like all of the dialogue sure and hyper light drifter was a game that literally had no text like not only no dialogue but like there were no words in that game and and kind of comparing them i i think i like the abstraction a little more or whatever right but you know if if you take it out of that context it's just really cool. I mean, it's like it is one of the, the visually, I think, the most striking games of the year. Yeah, it has a thing that a weird amount of video games have now where it's just like uh, shattered buildings floating in the air is like weird that that's a game aesthetic that you can think of like 10 examples of. Uh, but this one does it really well. They kind of play with gravity where sometimes, you know, it's like you can something looks like a wall, but then you can just skate over it like the floor and then the whole world kind of like shifts. Um, yeah, it's it's neat. It's it's easy, which, again, is an, uh, you know, a surprising thing from the makers of Hyper Light Drifter, which was a game like defined by being hard. Like that was kind of that game's whole thing is like you will die immediately. Um, and so it's it's cool that this one's just so focused on like momentum instead of mastering combat um yeah i like it yeah i think i uh, jacob's points are like i agree with him like i think it's you know you'd have to ask me in six months but i th like i think i do like hyperlight drifter more yeah because it because of the abstraction of it like i do prefer me sort of make like trying to figure it out all on my own and then there and like the, in terms of like the plot and everything like I like the larger plot of what's happening but the moment to moment stuff it, my eyes glaze a little bit because it is kind the of a lot of voice acting is a little iffy I will also say it's like you know it's I, not even that it. for me yeah like it's it's just that it's like it's a they're they're it, they're using a lot of made up terms and I you know I'm not and maybe I don't track all of them but I yeah I like Ray is like the lead character I like her sort of I, I like her, her. She doesn't have a ton of personality, but I, I appreciate her like mission of just being like, I, it's kind of a lonely game too. Like there's yeah. a, everyone's pretty much dead. Who's trying to f trying to solve this problem. And she's kind of the last one to try to figure it out. And it's sometimes she's like arguing with her AI because she's just frustrated with the situation. Like I like that kind of stuff. I think that's cool. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I really like it a lot. Yeah. Oh, nice. I mean, what are we talking, Kyle? You think this is cracking your top five based on where you're at now? Yeah, I mean, for me, like, I, I need to finish it and kind sure. of uh, think about it a little bit. But for me, it's kind of like, is it going to be this or Returnal, I think. Really? As, uh, for my number one, yeah. Wow, like that high? Yeah, I, I, I like it that much, yeah. Jeez, well, I'm glad I didn't let you down. But yeah, Solar Ash, and it's out on PS5 and PC. PC, yeah. Yeah. It's I'm four, too, right? Is it PS4 as well? Yes. Yeah, it's PS4 mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, People like me. I will say, Kyle, I'm <laughs> curious if if you agree with this. Um, give me more disaster piece. I feel like the music <laughs> yeah. actually isn't as emphasized as I was hoping. Uh, again, this is a hyper light drifter comparison thing, but like there are moments in that game where it's just like blah blah, like the whole kind of scene was taken up by the music. And this, it, there's like a really cool tone when you press like you know resume game or like play game it gives you a cool little chord but other than that the the music hasn't been that memorable and the hyper Light drifter has my favorite game soundtrack probably <laughs> and so that was a little yeah. disappointing i mean but i don't know maybe i'm misremembering but like hyper Light drifter it has a couple themes but i mean overall it's it's kind of one of those soundtracks that just really hits you over the head with tones right like really sets like you come up on a boss and it's just like Bah, you yes. know like less and, less like a song that you like get stuck in your head there there wasn't quite as much of those tones in this it definitely has them yeah. but they're not as as like the, the 
when you're fighting the bosses, that's about the most it takes front and center. But for the mm-hmm. most part, it is like when you enter a new area, you kind of hear some like weird tinkling and stuff like that. It's yeah, I, I do like it, but I I, you're, I agree with you, Jacob, for sure. Yeah. Uh, hey, Jacob, you also said you want to talk about this game called X01. And I was like, eh, we're going to be going long, Jake. I, I don't know if we got it. Um, and then I went and, and checked it out uh, this morning a little bit, and I love this weird game. <laughs> like, I, I played, like, honestly, just the opening. I was like, okay, we're, we're definitely talking about this. X01, it's on Game Pass now. How would you describe what this game is, Jacob Geller? Oh, it's just it's just another one of those, like, uh, space indie marble uh, movement sims. <laughs> you yeah. know? So, <laughs> yeah, how the hell do you describe this? You're on a planet in the beginning called Sagan 4, just to really set the tone. And then you're a marble and you just hit R2 to like drop in gravity. So you're trying to use the curvature of these planets and the environments to build up your speed to better navigate these absurd, beautiful, artistic, weird worlds. And then when you're in the sky, you can hit another button to flatten out and glide around. Uh, I think this is very cool. It's it, it, it's good. I will have I will have a review of it on Polygon at some point. Really? Um, but it's yeah, it's like it it's it's all about there. There are no kind of like impediments in your way for basically the whole game. And it's just like the thing you need to get to is just a really far away. Like that's right. that's how the whole game works. And so you can make yourself really heavy and make yourself really light and just go so fast through through these worlds. And and every every planet kind of looks like the skybox of a bungee game. You know, (laughs) it's like it's like you're playing through the background of a destiny level or something. And it's just these kind of like smooth rolling hills or endless oceans or whatever. And you're just this marble that that zips around or can turn into a disc or whatever and it's like it it just there's only like one mechanic in the game but it feels so good yeah and and the game's not very long and so it's like that's all you need that that's all it takes that's solid yeah xo1 is the name of that one exo i have a uh, a quick question yeah not not to throw jet under the bus (laughs) but is this kind of what I wanted from Jet and didn't quite get from Jet. Yes, it is. Uh, I mean, there's like d- very little story in this. Um, so it's like if if mo- if flying around in the ship in Jet felt good, like that's what this feels like uh, at the exclusion of everything else. Yeah, I, gotcha. okay. I thought of Jet as well. It's weird that it's coming up so much on this podcast, but like with Solar Ash and X01, it's like. It feels like both of them are kind of hitting a vibe that Jet was going for and just didn't quite land. Um, it's one of the more interesting releases of the year just for its reception, where it's like, hey, Super Brothers are back. And it's kind of a complicated thing to talk about. I, bro, and just to be say something nice, uh, the first 30 minutes of Jet are like okay. fantastic. Okay. I love the opening of Jet, but it was right when you kind of, when the game sort of kicks in, they're like, all right, this is what the game is, and you're right. sort of stuck on an island for five minutes. Like, I was like, uh, okay. I yeah, mean, I, I, yeah, I fully beat that game, and I think the really? story is interesting throughout, but it is. Uh, I think you can make a, you know, you can make arguments about like how it's kind of intentionally not fun like the gameplay kind of adds to the story or whatever but that doesn't like that doesn't diminish the fact that like it's not fun yeah there's there's (laughs) an interesting um interview about it on uh next lander's podcast they talked to the creators just about like what what happened why did you make the decisions you did and it's just that case of them just being like yeah we just we're working on it for so long we couldn't tell what it was anymore we probably should have brought in more people focused on just the minute to minute gameplay but they just built up so much lore and they thought that never getting the ship was going to be enough and so i always like hearing those interviews for games that didn't quite stick the landing and just hearing the devs try and reflect i'm like i feel like we were close i don't know what did you think of it we don't know really what we made here we were so deep in the weeds but yeah it's an interesting one uh hey kyle do you know how this whole thing operates do you know why this podcast exists 
I mean, I think we're doing it to prevent a planet from getting swallowed up by a black hole. Right? That's, that's right. Our that's goal. right. Which you can help with by going to patreon.com slash minmax with two ends. We appreciate your support. New month. Great time to jump in and support us. We appreciate it. People like uh, Mackenzie Zastro, latest supporter here at MinMax. Uh, they say, longtime listener since the Game Informer days. I've been meaning to support for a while, but it was the 100 Reasons to be Thankful video that finally made me sign up for Patreon at the $5 tier. So thank you, Mackenzie. We appreciate it. You can be like Mackenzie, everybody. Um, and thank you to to our bigger supporters, wonderful folks like, of course, Diverge Coffee. They want everybody to know that Diverge Coffee was started in 2020 by two friends, Bryant and Nick. We're excited to be able to support MinMax, and if you enjoy high-quality coffee, consider supporting us back. Being the nerds that we are, we have meticulously created roast profiles for each of our high-quality, ethically-sourced coffee beans. Go to DivergeCoffee.com and browse our selection of blends and single-origin roasts. Once you find what you like, be sure to use the promo code MINMAX, two N's, they stress, uh, at checkout to get 15% off of your order. Again, that's DivergeCoffee.com, discount code Min Max for 15% off. It's so fun to plug coffee on the podcast. Uh, I love it. And we gave away a Diverge Coffee on Twitter last week to Andrew Delby and Fred DeNovo. So please enjoy your Diverge Coffee. Also, thank you to the fine folks at Fixture S1. They want everybody to know about the Fixture S1, which is a clip that you put on your Nintendo Switch Pro Controller so you can play uh, with the best controller on the go. Jacob Geller, have you seen one of these suckers? I've seen it. It's real cool. It is very cool. Uh, it's available on Amazon. There's a link below. Uh, $35. You can also get a carrying case and bundle. But again, if you like playing with the Switch Pro Controller, which you're a maniac if you don't, and you like playing on the go, then the Fixture S1 is a great option for you. Uh, we gave a Fixture S1 away last week to Jared Baumout for following us on Instagram. So check that out as well. Thank you to Fixture Gaming and Fixture S1. Also, uh, Biggie this week, of course, we have the one and only uh, I'm 8-Bit supporting us. And they want everybody to know about the Turnip Boy Commits Tax Evasion vinyl soundtrack, which is available in their wonderful online store. Uh, it is the soundtrack with album art by Nicole, Nicole Gustafson and music by James Courier and Ryan Borborn. It includes the digital download, also comes well, with a sticker sheet. And you can find it in I'm 8-Bit's wonderful online store, along with a bunch of other stuff. And everything under $100 in that store you can get for 10% off using this Patreon... Or not even Patreon exclusive, podcast exclusive promo code, which is Turbo Time. Turbo Time, everybody, for the month of December, no space. Type that in at checkout and you will get 10% off. So thank you to I Am 8-Bit for their support. And because they're so generous, each and every week, they give away a prize to a member of the Minnex community, whoever has the best question of the week. This week, they are going to ship out the Shadow of the Colossus vinyl soundtrack which I don't even own. I would chop That's off an arm for this. I'm going to ask a question. Maybe I can get a question of the week. Uh, so Emily Reese, please help us remember each and every question submitted here. And then we have to choose our absolute favorite and they get this great prize from Ian Bate. Oh so, so really, I mean, focus. This is like SAT level. Don't blow it, Emily Reese. God. Well, where's the list? Now I got to get the list. <laughs> no, no, don't. We'll read them off. Just, you know, remember the fun ones and uh, we can go back to it. Okay, here we go. Community questions, everybody. Uh, Zach Galo writes in and says, hey, how much does a game's soundtrack affect your enjoyment of said game? I feel like music and sound design are a bigger deal for me than most, to the point that I would say I prioritize sound and music over graphical fidelity. If a game has a less memorable soundtrack, I find it tends not to stick with me over time. Games are an interactive medium, and we talk a lot about gameplay and visuals, but I feel like the audio might be the single most under-discussed aspect of any given game. Why is that? Because it's hard to understand, I think. It's very abstract. We take it for granted. We don't understand ambient sound, which is what we hear all the time. We don't understand how important it is to make plays sound real. And I think it's just kind of hard to... It's easy to describe things you see, and I don't know. It's, yeah, just, I, it's I, difficult I, to conceptualize how important I it also is think, to the um, I think you're right. I was also going to say, I think music's more subjective, too like whether you like it or not like it's a little or i'm sorry less subjective where like you can look at you know the visuals and be like oh these look really good or you can be like oh these look like last gen or something like that where music right. is like i can love the soundtrack and you can hate it and we're both right you know so what's the point of talking about it but i think even like sound design, well, yeah i think that's why it's harder to talk about not not what not, not that there's no point in talking about it um yeah yeah, and I think there's something you're right about, like, especially with the generational leaps of the video game industry, it's so much easier to be like, oh, this is the best looking game ever. Look at this, the visuals. That's the big thing we're upgrading each generation. And 
outside of Sony pushing for like 3D audio this generation, everybody's like, no one really cares. I still don't really know what that means. <laughs> you know, like it's just, it's less exciting. It's less of like the bullet point for marketing uh, that everybody likes to push in the game industry. It's just the audio yeah, overall. I, mean, I do think it's it's really interesting when a game kind of breaks through and everyone is aware of its soundtrack in a right. cool way. Right. I think most obviously, though I've also spent a lot of time with this recently, but it's like Hotline Miami, like as many or more people know that soundtrack than have actually played the game. I think, you know, if you look at like you know, Breath of the Wild music with rain on YouTube has like a million views, you know, like there, there are some of these things that people do really, really connect with. Um, but it, it doesn't happen. It doesn't feel like it's often like the point of discussion is the music. It just kind of like simmers into the consciousness. Right, right. Uh, Andrew Burns, uh, submits a question over on Patreon and says, Hey, we all have our favorite games, but do you look back on particular sessions or playthroughs as your favorites? I have standout memories, uh, collaborating with my cousin and actually finishing Shadow of the Colossus way back in the day. And that still colors my feelings towards that game. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, specific sessions compared to just favorite games. I don't know, Kyle, you got like a go-to session in your mind? Yeah, uh, the midnight release of Halo 2 was huge for me. Like, I made sure that uh, my college classes that I hadn't used up my days off, you know, like I'm taking that day off. I stayed up all night playing the game, which I I never really did and still don't really do. Uh, because I just wanted to know, like, what what is the future? What is the next thing for Halo? Halo was such a staple for me and my friends that it was really important for me to see, like, what was next. And then I got to the point where you you play as the Arbiter. It yeah. Was, like, really late. It was like two or three o'clock in the morning, and I was like, I have to keep going. Like, this is crazy. You're not playing as Master Chief. This is insane. Yeah. Did they hide that in all the marketing? Yeah. At least, I, I mean, I was watching it really closely, and it was a total surprise for me. Oh, that's wild. So you're just by yourself, just blasting through it. Yeah, yeah. See, most of us have, like, fond memories of working with people like Andrew Burns here, but I like that. Like, the game is so powerful, you didn't even need friends in the same room. That was just all you, <laughs> baby. Well, Halo 1 is the answer, then, if it's worth right. going with, the with friends mode. Right. Any Halo 1 <laughs> session, you know? That's the way to go. Yeah, I, I was thinking, it's probably, like, my first time, well, there was... So I became friends with old best friend Ronnie back in the day for because I borrowed his first disc of Final Fantasy VII, and then he wouldn't give me the second one for some reason. He was being a monster. And so we then just went over to a, a mutual friend's house and played through all the second disc and all the third disc in one night into the morning. Uh, and like seeing that game for the first time in that environment was, was so fun. Yeah, it was, a, it was a freaking journey. But that was probably my favorite gaming session ever, just sitting in this crappy basement with a cement floor just being awestruck by what i was seeing on the screen like oh this cloud subconscious stuff is crazy late at night is perfect i mean i've got you know how many times have i played through skyrim it's been a few years now but i've got favorite playthroughs of that on various consoles and uh also pretty much any really any co-op game i have really great memories of like playing through those Lara Croft co-op games that came out. Um, oh, like the isometric factors. ones? like tr- tr- Yeah, yeah. There was Guardian the of Temple of Osiris. But then there was the... Fr- yeah, yeah. Those were super fun with various players. <laughs> I but love also, that. Also, and it's funny that, uh, you, that you mentioned Hades a few days ago on Twitter because oh, yeah. I've had a lot of fun playing through that with a um, mutual friend of ours, Holly Harrison. Oh, yeah. And we just trade the controller back every few chambers or every few encounters. And it's just... So fun to play that game that way, too. Um, yeah. Because so, you get to see, like, there's your specific differences with the builds. Like, okay, I always go this way. I always go for this weapon. Like, and just kind of luck of the yeah, draw, too. Who gets screwed also over? Also, just, I think with any game that's boss fight oriented, it's really fun to watch someone else approach a boss. And then you try what they tried. Or, you know, you just you just learn more about boss fighting as you're watching other people do it. So that, that stuff's really fun, too. Yeah, that game, in a minute. Like beat Hades and now I just kick his ass all the time, which I think is everybody's right thing with that game. But uh, but yeah, that was that's that's a really fun because I love playing that game by myself. But it is much more it's like really fun and meaningful to do it with a friend for sure. Yeah, um, I was thinking about recently. I think 
I think the single most fun I've ever had playing a video game was at a middle school friend's house with the Wii WarioWare, oh, which I can't remember. Moves. Yeah. Yeah. Which I don't know if that's a good WarioWare or not. It was just the first one that I had ever played. And and that's I great. have I have a very specific memory of like there's one of those micro games that was just drop the controller and it was to like <laughs> test if you were wearing the wrist strap or not and my friend wasn't and just dropped it on the floor and i was like that's the funniest thing that's ever happened yeah, someone God. just standing up and being like Boop, and just letting the wii <laughs> controller fall to the floor um i also i played through almost all of god of war 3 with a friend like the first night that it came out um and he fell asleep and i didn't um and at some point he woke up and i was still playing this and and he was like you're still playing and i i uttered a phrase that has become legendary in our friendship, which was just like frustratedly yelling at him. I have no magic and no life. <laughs> and I was immediately like, don't say anything. <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, Taylor C writes Ed and says, Hey, I deal with anxiety pretty regularly. And if I'm, if I'm having a tough week, tense boss battles or fast paced action games can trigger the anxiety. That said, I do enjoy those tense, difficult games. My mind is more chill. I'm playing Hades again. And man, it's just so good. Even when it's tense, uh, do games make you anxious sometimes any particular games or moments stick out? What do you do when you find yourself getting worked up in those tense moments? I mean, I used to play call of duty, so <laughs> I know what it's like to get annoyed and frustrated. And I mean, I over the course of the pandemic, the amount of time that I spent with the music from Half-Life Alex and that music is really dark and heavy. Right. And that there were times where I just be like, oh, got to take a break. Can't can't deal with Half-Life today. Can't <laughs> deal with this music, you know, and I think I think, you know, gameplay is is the same way. I mean, yeah, definitely there are games that I just i'm like i my mood i can't do that right now and it's usually something that's hectic like a a first person shoot like i would not play Fortnite on a day when i'm not having a good day you know what i mean right. like it's just yeah. yeah that's my take on it yeah i think most of it comes down to like social stuff for me where it's like i mean if it's a game i like it's like it feels like a big social commitment to like okay play with a big group of friends like <laughs> i don't know there's gonna be audio issues uh, i don't know yeah, yeah, it's really it, it, the multiplayer games can kind of uniquely d trigger my it, it's like it's not anxiety as much as just like making me feel bad because yes. I think one of the things that I like about games is like they're predictable and you can get better at them. And there are right. some games kind of like Hades that used to stress me out that now do the opposite because it's like I have control of this. And when you're just getting like pounded into the dirt repeatedly in in call of duty or halo or whatever it like it feels bad it's not it's not good yeah. yeah yeah i mean i usually if i'm not feeling relaxed then i just will move on to something else because it's such for me personally it, it became gaming became a refuge as opposed to somewhere where i wanted to feel more amped you know and when i was back in the day doing all the call of duty playing i mean it was just like every night i was just like yeah. you know just like every night and i'm like i can't i can't do that anymore i miss definitely parts of that but but that kind of like it's like i can't i don't want to cross that line anymore i need to be like one with the gaming experience in a happy way right know? right just go and play skyrim <laughs> one more time and just kind of yeah. get lost one in that more world. just one more yeah it's weird. I, I find these like high stress games like I, maybe it's like a catharsis thing. But like I remember I was playing uh, Elden Ring for the beta. Right. And I later learned I was really stuck on the, the, the main boss that you get to in, the, in that beta that they offered. And I found out later that I was doing it the wrong way. I was playing it the hard way. Like I basically wasn't using a very important special ability mm. to get through it. And I was on try like 15 or 20 and I'm like why am I doing this to myself? Like am I enjoying this? And like <laughs> <laughs> but the answer was yes. Like it's it's weirdly it's like it, even though it's like ang it 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 does inspire some kind of anxiety. It's like it's a release, I guess, for me. And then uh, when you when you finally do break through that barrier and beat that boss, it's like it feels great. Yeah. It's, so it's like I I it doesn't like generate anxiety for me in a weird way. It kind of like 
it, it almost does the reverse, but I don't know why. It's it's really strange. It shouldn't. It right. should stress me out and make me uncomfortable. But yeah. I, don't know. I think it's kind of mm. like the true true crime thing, maybe. I mean, I because I've always since I was I mean I was in the '90s and '80s watching Unsolved Mysteries and Rescue 911 yeah. and all that stuff, and now Forensic Files all day, and give me all the investigate discovery shows and all that stuff. And and I think for sometimes like those can be really sad and depressing and stressful and scary but then you know it's also perspective for me sometimes i'm like okay well i'm having a better day than that whole situation so (laughs) you know sometimes that's and so that could be kind of a similar thing kyle where it's like these games that could be in you know too investive in terms of anxiety and stress for some people are really like you said cathartic you know yeah uh captain cobblepot Submits a question over on Patreon and says, hey, computer living cohorts, uh, remember how good PS2 music was? Generalization, but I think we're with you. Uh, I'm playing through the Sly Cooper series right now, and I just love oh. the big band jazz style. It gives me those sneaky riff bandit vibes. <laughs> Hell well, yeah. isn't that Peter McConnell too? I think it might Didn't be. Didn't he do Sly yeah. Cooper? I'll have to look into yeah. it, but maybe. Uh, but yeah, ca- that's amazing. <laughs> uh, Kabelfot asks, what older games do you think got the mood right on point or are super memorable? Yeah, I guess uh, that generation soundtracks that are just like setting the mood perfectly. Does uh, it have to be PS2? Can I it guess be earlier? Not. It can be whatever you want, man. Super Metroid. Really interesting. Yeah, I mean, if we're talking about setting the mood, that's like just the Metroid. single most atmospheric soundtrack there is. Yeah, that's funny because I was immediately thinking of uh, Metroid Prime for like setting oh, a mood. But I guess that was my first Metroid, yeah. so maybe it's just whatever your first Metroid was just sets such a distinct mood <laughs> that it really carries through. Um, yeah, well, like, those soundtracks are so abstract and like different, which is nice. Just they're just so different. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. But yeah. I was uh, I was thinking about Metroid Prime a lot recently actually because uh, Game Informer has a new podcast hosted by a friend of the show, Ben Reeves, called Video Gameography where him and Marcus Stewart are going through uh, every Metroid game. Um, yeah, and so, yeah I, might, I might be on that soon. We'll see. Ooh, interesting. Um, but they've been talking Maybe so much talk about, about Metroid Prime. The There's no way of knowing. Oh, uh, interesting. <laughs> uh, but yeah, just like remembering how specific the mood is from the title screen to Metroid Prime. And like, I remember just listening to that endlessly and then Fendrana drifts. Like, oh, the music's so good. Uh Joshua Caleb writes in and says, hey, Ben 10 and the Jets, you got it. Uh, what are your thoughts on games with multiple endings and routes? I have a hard time finding the time slash energy to play a game once. I can't imagine playing it multiple times, especially lengthy RPGs in order to see all the different ways the story could have gone or to get more character backstory and motivations that were missing from the route I took. I hear you, Joshua Caleb. It can be stressful. I have a, um, I'll, I'll come out strong. Yeah. I'm done with multiple endings. I don't want multiple endings. And and the reason is not that uh, I am, you know, sad that it would take a long time to see both of them. It's that like, you know, it's, it's a broad statement. There are exceptions, but like I'm tired of games that can end one of two like opposite ways because mm. then it feels like, well, what was the game doing? Like, it seems really hard to build up a consistent theme within your game if the ending can be like two diametrically opposed things and it just makes the whole makes the whole thing feel like less authored. Uh, this was a, a recent frustration in Death Loop. Like the fact that mm. you can choose the ending in Death Loop to me just kind of like undercuts the whole thing and I feel like prevents it from saying something really strong. At the end of it, um, yeah. I would rather just see like where the author thought the story was going uh, because you've been playing a character the whole time. It's very hard to just be like you in that place. Yeah, Does that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, I got you. Where do you stand on um, a game that I just finished and very much enjoyed this weekend? Uh, Forgotten City without spoilers on like the multiple endings there. Is that getting a pass? I think that gets a pass because there's. It's 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 a time loop and there's one that you're like supposed to get. It feels like pretty the, obvious, yeah. The last one is called the canon ending. And so it's like that one I was like, okay, like you know, I like that there were other endings I arrived at before doing it because they made it easy and it was kind of thematically consistent to get all of them. Right, right. Okay. So that loop ending gets a pass. Got it. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, Jacob, I, I am like 100% with you. This is like a hot take I've been ruminating on for a long time in that like I don't I don't think I like choice in video games. I because like <laughs> the the it, it, I I don't because like first of all it sort of exposes the matrix, right? It like right. it sort of breaks the world for me. It's like knowing that I could go in two different different directions reminds me that it's a video game which I don't like. Uh, I like the sort of you know, like staff in the ground authored experience. This is what we want the ending to me. The idea that a good ending exists implies to me that that should be the ending. Why are there other ones? Like if if you, if you thought about this as a story and you figured out the best, most, like most emotionally impactful way to end it, then just give me that. Like I've gotten to a point now where if it's a game that like, doesn't you know it's it's choices aren't like a major part of it you know like in the marketing or something like that like like ghost of tsushima is a game that like doesn't wasn't really sold on like having choices when it it does have one at the end and it bummed me out like i was like i was disappointed that i had to to choose like i i didn't i Jin is a separate character from me like i mm. want to know what happened to Jin and what happened in his life and like like I said, it's it's sort of like 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 a hot take that I've been thinking about a lot. But like, I would much rather have the sort of the the best story told, and the way you do that is like you have an authored experience that has a specific route. Yeah, I mean, it's like the Last of Us Two has a contentious ending that I'm not, I'm still not sure how I feel about. But I am so glad that it has just an ending because right. I think if they like let you make a choice in the end then it would have it would have just like like that game is working towards a single point and the ending is that point and if you were able to like undercut it then it would feel like you just like didn't do what the game was working towards yeah games should have a canonical ending and then one or two silly endings. We're talking Silent Hill 2 dog ending. That's right. Yeah. We're talking, who was I'm controlling okay the whole thing. Right. Cool. And then like Chrono Trigger ending where you just go around and talk to the developers at the end of time. Like that level of wacky is what I want. It's just options, you know? We uh, could just do the way Mass Effect 3 did it where they gave us the illusion of choice and then... Right. It's the classic Everyone stuff. loved that. Right. I mean, <laughs> we all right. Everyone, everyone. That went over really, really well. Oh. No. Yeah. Uh, Joe Kafchinski. By the way, I didn't really see it with the Legendary Edition. Maybe because it was at the end of such a long road. Did anybody see any hot, hot takes on Mass Effect 3's ending this year? Other than no, hey, so no one, no one actually beats remasters when they come out. I think out. you're they right. They just play the first hour and get nostalgic, and then they move on. That's there was a very good <laughs> people work. make games video yep. on that on the the ending. Right. This like it wasn't a hot take, more of a nuanced history. <laughs> Boo. <laughs> uh, but Joe <laughs> Kefchinski writes in over on Patreon and says, "Simple question here." Uh, Joe asks, "Halloween specials or Christmas specials?" This is tough. Do you want to know which ones we like to watch, or are we choosing, do we prefer Halloween or Christmas? Oh, uh, which we prefer to watch. Yeah. Halloween. Halloween specials, Halloween specifically. Because sure. yeah. if you rope in Treehouse of Horror from The Simpsons, like, it does really tilt the scales. I mean, yeah. as, as a Jew, I'll say that the single best holiday <laughs> special is, like, Charlie Brown Christmas. Yeah. And there's just, yeah, there's true. no yeah. question. But That's true that's a high watermark and i feel like most other christmas stuff is not very good whereas like halloween is more like a bad halloween movie i think is fun and a bad christmas movie i don't think is fun it's because it's schmaltzy compared yes. to yeah at yes. least you got some it's jump scares or something yeah. yeah but i think i really like it like i love yeah the charlie brown christmas the garfield christmas special was very important to me growing up like i rewatched mm, all of the all community the christmas episodes are very good see there we go there we go true but also also hey, all the humanity halloween episodes are good doctor who there's some yeah. good doctor who christmas mm. for Ooh, sure there we don't go forget about that you know, one thing, uh, while we're thinking of like sitcoms, like there's always, that's like an important episode, the Halloween sitcom episode, right? Yeah. It always yeah. bums me out that the costumes are so professional. Like I want, oh, yeah. I want, you know, that oh. episode of Friends where they have the Halloween party to everyone have like really crappy costumes. I want the actors to make their costumes. And <laughs> that's a good them. way to go about it. I don't want the it. costume designer to make the costumes. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, hey, this is a really good quick, uh, place to shout out i actually really genuinely liked 8-bit christmas on hbo max you know about this hansen yeah I, it, it snuck up on me i saw a trailer then uh and was like yeah i didn't hear anybody else talk about it except for you and wade wojcik we're like 8-bit christmas rules and i don't i don't know <laughs> I what to make it. it i mean i'm not gonna be like it rules but i like i really <laughs> laughed it's 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 chris it's christmas story to a fault like it's that they just use that template a hundred percent except um, they're going but, for 
uh, an NES, and it's back in the eighties. Yeah, and it's and it's I don't know. It was it really surprised me. I really I laughed a lot, and I really thought it was very funny. Huh. All right. I, I watched the trailer, and I was like, "Were NESs that hard to get back then? Like maybe towards it's the end not, of its life." It's, I mean, not not to like, it's not a spoiler, but it's not that he can't find an NES, is that his parents don't want him to buy one. So he's trying to figure out okay. a way to get around that. Mm, and um, and it's, it's a little ahead of my generation. Like, I'm, I'm probably the next generation in terms of like the era it's tackling of like being a child right. of that time. Right. But it's close enough where I'm like, oh yeah, I remember that. I remember that, you know. Will they make a sequel called 16-Bit Christmas? I hope so. 32-Bit Christmas. Are we going to see it, Kyle? <laughs> The 128 bit Christmas. Yeah. Uh, Austin Nicholson, if you sleep with the TV on, what is your go to show slash movie you go to bed to? My wife has Brooklyn Nine Nine mm. on a constant loop, it feels like. <laughs> that seems like a solid one. I don't fall asleep. It's almost to it. always Star Trek for me. Yeah. Ooh. Uh, okay. Just working just through all of them? Or? It doesn't even matter. Yeah. Usually I pick, uh, well, not usually, but sometimes I'll pick it based on the theme song that I don't want to wake me up, you know? <laughs> So. so you never watch Enterprise, I guess, right? Yeah. That's never. <laughs> uh, so if I'm trying to fall asleep, I usually don't. That's it's funny because it gets pretty loud. But yeah, DS, DS9 is a good it's pretty one. bad. <laughs> huh? I just agree. Uh, Kyle, do you have any idea how obsessed your brother was with uh, Next Generation? Because I lived with your brother for quite a while. Yeah, I and grew up with him. He would just listen to Star Trek podcasts just walking around the house. So... Wow. By proxy, I do absorb like hundreds of hours of Star Trek Next Generation podcasting. I love that. That's great. <laughs> it was a lot. It was, a, it was important for us, man. It was a big deal. I get it. Uh, Kyle, you it's seem true. like a fall asleep with the TV show or the TV show on kind of guy, man. Uh, no, not really. I mean, certainly there was a time, but like I, when I, on those occasions that I do, if I'm like not feeling well or something like that, it's usually like classic anime that I really love like Akira mm. is a movie that I like to just have on which is weird because it's not like it's a nightmare it's, it's a weird one right but it's just <laughs> so familiar to me uh, like those that that like anime that I've watched over and over and over I, I also like the new Star Wars the set uh, episode 7 in particular is what? one that I like to just put on if I'm not feeling well because I, I don't Rogue know I just really like, like that movie Rogue one. Yeah. oh Rogue One really yeah, yeah. go to like sci-fi yeah, comfort, comfort Rogue food one for sure oh that's interesting. I don't have a TV movie. in my bedroom but yeah it's a we we alternate almost every other night going back and forth between Mary Tyler Moore. We're in the third season nice. now, and then um, Shit's Creek, also in the third season. Yes. And uh, by the way, Mary Tyler Moore still very good. Everybody, <laughs> that show rules. Yes. Uh, and Jacob Keller, I don't know. You're you're smart. You fall asleep reading a th- thesaurus or something. I can't even. See. I, I don't, but I just I just can't I can't fall asleep if a screen is on. Like I have I have memories of like being at sleepovers where all my friends sit, were asleep and I was just like there's a movie playing and I'm not even that interested in it but right. like I have to watch this movie it's on and I have no magic and I have, I no, have life. no magic and I have no <laughs> life I yeah, have I'm glad that. we all got there uh, <laughs> Jonathan Fanwright says hey Evan Maxers what's the best game in which the name of the game is said by a character it's trickier than it sounds technically cast the parrot yeah. sings the phrase breath of the wild in the champions ballad DLC but no one ever says the Legend of Zelda, so I don't think it counts. Um, uh, the true. correct answer is super hot. <laughs> Damn it. That's very <laughs> That's good. good. The end of every level. I was going to go with that mm-hmm. moment where the first time you see the, the big ape on the horizon and somebody says, look out. That's Peter Jackson's King Kong, the official game of the movie. <laughs> uh, no, I th- It has to be Halo, right? Yeah, they say Halo a lot. They yeah. never stop shutting up with that Halo. Or in- well, I was thinking of just like I was working backwards from like best games, right? And, you know, just like not not even necessarily like my favorite games, but widely considered to be amazing games. I was like, I don't think they ever say The Last of Us in The Last no, of Us. No. You know, I don't think they ever mm. say Uncharted in Uncharted. It's some <laughs> sort of Super Metroid. Yeah, I, I don't um, think it ever. I like in the um, the like God of War, uh, not. 2018 like the original god of war just them talking about Ares, and i think the last the last line is something like you know the new god of war and i was like oh man they did it god of war one has an amazing ending partially because it does not hint that there will ever be a sequel to that game it's like he was the god of war through like world war ii is like the implied ending of god of war one really 
Oh I yeah, I can watch that again. Yeah, it's like it's like, like, it's like it just shows him sitting like, on a throne, and now. you see like yeah, you see like the Civil War and like <laughs> Vietnam. What? Yeah, <laughs> shut up! You're pulling my leg. I'm not. You see I mean, Vietnam just, like, and... pictures, but it's yeah. <laughs> that's insane. <laughs> I gotta go back and play God of War one. I guess I never made it past the spike pillar. Uh, okay, God's Garage asks, "Hey, what's one video game composer you wish you could talk to, but have never had the chance to?" Emily, I mean, this is this oh, is God. up your alley. I mean, I I immediately think of like every single Japanese composer I've never interviewed, like Koji Kondo or yeah. uh, Nabuo Umatsu, Uematsu or yeah. any of those. But I also think of like Mick Gordon from Doom. I've always wanted to interview Mick, and I've never had a chance to interview him. Um, but I don't know. I've I've been pretty lucky. Otherwise, I guess. Um, yeah. And your favorite composer to interview is, of course. Well, I mean, I I only interviewed him once, um, and he's no longer with us. Norman Corby from uh, Heavy Rain and Indigo Prophecy and huh. all those games way back in the day. That was probably one of my favorite interviews ever. But there have been so many. Like, I really couldn't pick who do I like talking to now. Like, I mean. I some of these people at this point I've been doing it for so long I've interviewed them five or six times so it's right. like that makes it super fun to talk to them um but in a different way but but yeah I I don't I don't know who I would pick right now um yeah it's got to be just that Japanese yeah. world you're totally right like a Hiptanaka yeah like Mitsuda like yeah I mean like just that. any any of them really it's <laughs> like yeah yeah that's pretty cool uh I don't know Kyle or Jacobs or one that stands out for you uh, well, back at uh, Toby DI Fox. when Toby Fox, oh Toby course. Fox, Hanson's talked to him before. Yeah, he was on the Game Informer show once, right when it launched, right when Undertale launched. But um, when Cadence of Hyrule came out, I I tried to talk to Baranowski. Yeah, like what? How do you make Zelda music like official? So I guess in quotes, official like Zelda music. Uh, but they it was. I couldn't find any headway into talking to him. They are mm-hmm. locked down. It's that tough thing yeah. of, yeah, you know, we can talk about our careers, but we cannot mention this Nintendo project. It's so frustrating. Yeah. <laughs> um, Chris Logan writes in and says, hey, everybody. Oh, hang on. He doesn't say, hey, everybody. He says, hello, Ben and the cursed cohorts. I'm sorry <laughs> to hear about the witch that cast a spell on you all. Now, whenever mm-hmm. you all are actively gaming, you will age at two times speed. How do you plan oh, on no. handling this? <laughs> I think you, I mean, just continue in the direction that I've <laughs> been going, which is playing exclusively two hour or less games. OK, so just wait for like end of the year discussions and then just cherry pick the like, OK, we're going before your eyes. We're going Artful Escape. Those will be the two games I play this year. I mean, XO one. Uh, yeah. You know, you could play play things with a walkthrough. <laughs> Play Genesis Noir looking at a guide. <laughs> I think that's probably the right way to go because you would feel so guilty every time you booted up a game. I mean, Emily. It, I mean, I would never play like a multiplayer and open world game again. Anything no. that's kind of like endless. Yeah. Uh, just nope. It's out. Yeah. yeah. Skyrim's out the window. I'm sorry, Emily. It's gone. It's gone. Well, I think I think my relationship with Skyrim is is different now. Like, I don't think I will ever play it again. I might, but I mean, I think I... I think three consoles worth of Skyrim with several playthroughs. I think it's enough. You know, I think I had my quota, I guess. I don't know. Never say never because it's been a few years. Who knows? But yeah, there's still Skyrim (laughs) VR, which Kyle can tell you the triumphs and tribulations that he went through (laughs) through that experience. Oh, yeah. I mean, I guess. I've never gotten more angry emails about a review (laughs) than when I wrote Skyrim (laughs) VR. Realistically, though, like. Surprised at all. I, I just I want to figure out like double speed. How yeah. much would that? How much would that actually affect you? Right. I guess you're right because like what sixty hour game. It's like that's not shaving years off your life or nothing. You know because it's like so ten thousand hours of something, which is like you know t- playing ten thousand hours of games in a year. I feel like would be or even in in many years would be like huge. Yeah. Um. You know, is that's 415 days. So I don't know. It's like if you played 
I, I just don't think I think it actually wouldn't be that significant. Oh, overall. OK. All right. We'll but, take. I mean, there are he's rolling the dice, taking I, the risk that that speed up my life. Every time you get a hot now, dog, so. 37 <laughs> minutes yeah. you're gone. <laughs> that is a good <laughs> way of looking age. at it. Yeah. Your internal clock <laughs> is just aging with each bite of McDonald's or whatever the yeah, hell is going on. And vendors that take me years off. my life. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all, right, all right. What do you all like for question of the week? Emily, hate to put you on the spot, but uh, you're you're not real, at all. You're a guest of honor. I loved the I love the anxiety question because Ooh. I think it just shows how different we all are, you know, and how how one product can affect people differently. I love that. I think that's a great question. Yeah, uh, Kyle or Jacob, uh, will you fight I, this claim? No, no, that was <laughs> okay. the, I had written that one down too. Oh, nice. There we oh, go. Nice. That's Taylor yeah. C. Congratulations. You just won the vinyl soundtrack to Shout Out the Colossus from I Am 8 Bit. Thank you so much, nice. I Am 8 Bit, for shipping that out. Uh, now it's time for something that we call Get a Load of This. Get a load of it. Get a load of it. All right, uh, Jacob Keller, let's, let's show the world how it's done, man. Uh, get a load of this. Happy Hanukkah, everyone. Woo! Um, I'm going to I'm going to share a weird a weird factoid about the Jewish calendar. Um, it. <laughs> it's very early this year. This is the third, fourth night of Hanukkah, uh, and it's December 1st. Um, and you might ask, why does it move around so much? It's because Judaism's on the lunar calendar, which does not fit with the solar calendar at all. And so to combat that next year, there will be a leap month. In the Jewish what? calendar, <laughs> there's there's oh. a month called Adar, and then there will be Adar two, <laughs> because if not, all of the holidays would get so skewed that you would end up having Hanukkah in the middle of July or whatever, and so there will be a leap a month to kind of reset everything. That's wild. I love that stuff. Uh, hey everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, Let's see. Get a load of this. I'm still trying to decide which one to do. Um, let's see. There's an article from a New Yorker, and it's about Mel Brooks at age 95 and how he's writing his memoirs. And I don't know if you heard this, but they're also making History of the World Part 2. Uh, but in this piece uh, from the New Yorker, um, Mel Brooks shares his philosophy uh, here. And it's in a, in a tweet um, where he said, I've learned one very simple trick with dealing with studio notes. Simply say yes. Like the producers, uh, the producer producers said, quote, the curly haired guy, he's funny looking, fire him. He wanted me to fire Gene Wilder. And I said, yes, he's gone. I'm firing him. And I never did. But he forgot. After the screening of Blazing Saddles, the head of Warner Brothers threw me into the manager's office, gave me a legal pad and pencil and gave me maybe 20 notes. He would have changed Blazing Saddles from a daring, funny, crazy picture to a stultified, dull, dusty old Western. He said, no farting. And I said, it's out. <laughs> He said, you can't punch a horse. And I said, you'll never see it again. I kept saying, you're absolutely right. It's out. Then when he left, I just crumpled up all the notes. And I tossed it into the waste paper basket. And John Calley, who was running production at Warner Brothers at the time, said, good filing. That was the end of it. You just say yes, and then you never do it. It's like, Thank you, Mel Brooks. It's good <laughs> philosophy. so though. funny. <laughs> uh, it's amazing. Yeah. Emily Reese, you got one? Well, yeah, mine finally about Star Trek again. Uh, Perfect. Because I was, I've been rewatching Buffy, which I hadn't watched Buffy in years and years and years. So I'm going through Buffy again, and the God, what is his position now? I can't even remember. Malcolm from Enterprise is in a Buffy episode, and I just was like, "Is that Malcolm?" So that was my. <laughs> you know, you didn't know it or whatever. Wait. That's all. Just that that dude was in an episode of Buffy. In I, have to, uh, I have to look this up because I'm a big I'm a big Buffy fan, and so I want to know it's who the he's playing. Episode. He plays one of the lackeys for Kralik. Remember the um, on Buffy's 18th birthday when Giles takes away her powers. <laughs> oh God! And is going to lock her yeah, in the house with he's the, he's one of the. He Watchers plays one of the council guys. Yeah, yeah. Well, he's yeah. Well, yeah. I guess he's one of the guys. Yes, that's correct. <laughs> Weird. That's keeping Cray like all pilled up. Yeah. Speaking of music, so Buffy I got the theme song. Still all time great. Really? I oh, mean. I hate it. So I hate it. 
I hate it. And she's a music I expert, hate Jacob. Get I out hate of here. Every single theme song for every single Joss Whedon if anything. I just he's just the, the Firefly worst one's that. pretty dopey. That's right. Well, yeah. Firefly. I mean, I have no movie. disagreement that Angel Joss Whedon is, is the worst. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we know that. But yeah. I mean, yeah, the but I love that you love it because the second the second it's like the wolf howl. And I'm like, skip, 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 skip. <laughs> yeah, that's Please me. And I will too, never. So. Oh, <laughs> I love that you love it, though. That's great. <laughs> Kyle, what do you got, man? Uh, hey, get a load of this. I don't even remember how I found this, but uh, it's on this website, picklemans.com. Uh, study proves sandwiches taste better when someone else makes them. And this is like a Carnegie Mellon University study. And uh, apparently turns out, while you're making a sandwich, your brain is thinking about each ingredient and subconsciously already consuming it. By the time you take your first bite, your brain thinks that sandwich is old news and doesn't find the same satisfaction. And uh, wow. that explains a lot to me because I'm the one that does all the cooking in the house. Right. So. And that's why you're never satisfied. I, I thought that, that was interesting. That is good. That's fascinating. Hey, from the community in the Discord, uh, I mean, Leafion, who's the two-time uh, Trivia Tower champion over there, um, just in- had an interesting post that fit the theme here, which is that new Rocket League game is out, the mobile one that's 2.5D called Rocket League Sideswipe, and apparently Anamanaguchi did the soundtrack for it, which I had no idea. Oh, but really? hey, heads up, everybody. You can play Rocket League on your phone now if you want. All right. Speaking of soundtracks that elevate games to be better than they actually are, the Scott Pilgrim versus the World yes. video game. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Emily Reese, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I really do look forward to this each year. So it's a total pleasure. I love it. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, where should folks go if they want to hear more about your brilliant thoughts on game music? Go to levelwithemily.com or just Google Level with Emily. You'll find our Patreon and all those things. And that's also where you'll find the Half- the Half-Life Alex documentary is, yeah. you know, like I said, that's not behind a paywall or anything. So you just Google that. And then I also still do a podcast called Scores and Pours about with a co-host who is a sommelier. She talks about beer and wine. Cause all the things I talk about jazz and classical. That's that. awesome. Sweet. Appreciate it. Uh, let's see. We have stuff going on here at MinMax, uh, MinMax Council, our Patreon exclusive podcast, which you can access to at the five dollar tier. On this last episode, uh, we ranked the Spider Man films. Uh, I went deep on Survivor, so if you want to hear my thoughts and predictions for the end of the Survivor season, which is a fun one, jump in there. Uh, we also talk about the Beatles documentary Get Back uh, for a long time, which I don't know if anybody else has watched it. Emily, have you watched that thing? I have not. I oh. don't have how many hours? Uh, it's like 14 <laughs> no, I, hours. I, I yeah. Speaking of falling asleep while things are on TV. How dare you? Right? Oh, yeah. God. I think it's incredible. I've, I've it. read it's, a lot fun, about but it. But I did fall asleep. Okay, I okay. mean, the energy is just like a kind of bored podcast with the most famous people <laughs> who have existed in the past yes, 100 years. Yes, hanging out with uh, the And Beatles. I say that in like a very positive way. <laughs> yes, I love it. But yeah. we talk about it on the podcast. Um, also, let's see. Oh, the we have an interview with the developers um, of Guardians of the Galaxy. They went up on YouTube, also in the Patreon exclusive podcast feed. So hopefully you enjoy that. Uh, the second half, it's all timestamp for your convenience. The second half uh, goes deep on spoilers and stuff. So you can check that out. Uh, Leo's also streaming the beginning of Guardians of the Galaxy on Thursday on Twitch. If you want to follow us on Twitch. Um, Trivia Tower is coming up, everybody. Uh, for December, it looks like it's going to be December 12th. Sunday, December 12th is when Trivia Tower is happening. And I'm excited to spend time with the co-host for that one. We're not ready to quite announce it yet, but maybe on next week's episode of the podcast, which heads up next week is the Game Awards on Thursday. So next week, everybody, the MinMax show will be a little bit late. Um, we'll be recording it on that Friday after the game awards so it won't be live on thursday so just a heads up uh you did not accidentally unsubscribe it's just gonna be a a day late for you everybody also kyle we have the deepest dive to announce we're doing the deepest dive on halo infinite everybody we're gonna be tackling that game it's gonna be kind of a funky one it's gonna be (laughs) tackling it just the way kyle is tacking tackling his recording studio but we're gonna be breaking up into two parts and so the first part of Halo Infinite, um, it's going to be, you're going to be playing up until 
the campaign from 2020. So when the Pelican crashes, that's your stopping point for the first discussion of the deepest dive on Halo Infinite's campaign. And that's going to be happening then on December 13th. So play along with us. And then you can unlock that whole discussion in the podcast feed by supporting us on Patreon, or it'll be up on YouTube. And then because of the holiday break, this is going to be a funky one. We're going to be taking a big break and then covering the back half and everything else in Halo Infinite once we get back in early January. So we'll have plenty of time to, to play through that thing, but get ready for the deepest dive in Halo, Halo Infinite. Um, Let's see. Jacob Geller, you got stuff going on? Uh, kind of. I mean, just go to Jacob Geller on YouTube. Uh, I'll have a top 10 list coming out later this month. Um, so look forward to that. Uh, that's about it. Nice. Awesome. We also have uh, some notes from Brian Vore, who's doing social media stuff for us. Um, last week, we gave away a code for inscription on Instagram. Congratulations to Justin Dale for winning that code for inscription. Uh, this week, if you follow MinMax on Instagram and you leave a comment on the post when this podcast goes live, where it's all of our shining faces, you can win a code for Jacob Geller's Game of the Year before your eyes on That's Steam. That. If you want to watch my list, you'll be in suspense for the other nine games. <laughs> but you'll know what's number one. There we go. So give us a follow on Instagram. Check that out. Also, uh, yeah, we had the Diverge Coffee giveaway on Twitter. And we have a MinMax merch giveaway on Twitter happening as well. So give us a follow on Twitch and you can win some free MinMax merch. We have a ton of giveaways going all the time. Also... A lot of plugs here. Uh, friend of the show, Kelsey Lewin from the Video Game History Foundation. Uh, they have a big drive going on right now, a donation drive. So you can help support video game history and their work over there and just help thank her for all the work she's done for MinMax here by going to gamehistory.org slash donate. And there is a big 2021 fundraiser um, and all the donations are doubled through. Oh, it runs from November 30th, giving Tuesday through December 31st. The goal is to raise $40,000. Donations up to 21,000 will be doubled thanks to wonderful sponsors. Uh, and they want you to know that money is being used to fund video game preservation and education projects such as locating and resurrecting lost games, digitizing developer archives and preserving video game publications. Uh, we're going to be doing more work in the future with these folks, so any support you can throw their way is appreciated. Uh, it's a good group over there. All right, that's it. Hey, thanks, everybody. We did it, team. Look at us go. Good times. Good times. Thanks so much for watching or listening, everybody. We'll see you next week, but a little bit later. And thank you to all of our $50 supporters. You know who you are, but in case you don't, DivergeCoffee.com, Andrew Eukerwitz, Oppa Switch on Xbox, Chris, Shakes True King Music, Fixture Gaming's Fixture S1, I am 8-Bit, Ludwig Roque, Zachary Pliggy, Andrew Valla, Beaten Down Brian, PrettyGoodPrinting.com, Jawar Hello, Mirko Rico, Mirko Rico Toreno, Mark Seliga, John Higme, Call Me By Your Game Podcast, Drew Boranis, Dan Valone, Starkiller, Ted Reiser, Clemens Zobel, Steve Bamdad, Pure Bread Six Spider Dan, Prethem Your Legata, Spiral in Your Eyes, and General Day Dean 99. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you, Emily Reese. Be good, have fun, let's go, everybody. Bye.